I started my creative life in ceramics as a potter. And um, so I studied ceramics at Penn State with a guy named Ken Beidel. And um, Beidel, this is one of his pieces, um, he had studied in Japan with one of the living treasures there and uh, had brought back um, a lot of techniques, a lot of wheel throwing techniques and obviously some sort of decorative sensibility which you see on this pot. Um, but probably most important to me was a mindset toward materials. And um, so that has informed me uh, as much or more than any of the technical skills that I learned um, at Penn State. Um, ultimately, I broke away. And um, here's a piece that I did in graduate school that um, was quite um, under the spell of Japan. Um, I would throw very tightly done pieces and then um, play kind of a spontaneous surface off of them. And so that was much of what I did uh, in graduate school before uh, I moved to sculpture. And um, so um, the early sculpture um, really is a chronicle of my time at uh, the University of Montevallo, which is now 35 years at the school an amazing place to make art and um, the perfect place for me to rediscover or to discover next what I wanted to do as an artist because I really didn't want to um, ape a traditional style, uh, be too much under the shadow of um, Asia, although I respect it so much. So I needed to find my own way and came to a place that embraced other materials other than clay uh, I worked with a blacksmith at Sloss Furnace for a while, uh, making legs of pieces that uh, obviously had the strength of steel, which is able then to hold up things. Uh, thematically, my pieces, a lot of them dealt with uh, dislocation, uh, me being from the New York area and then coming to the Deep South and uh, all of the uh, relocation issues that might uh, arise. And so uh, a lot of my early pieces identified some sort of a rootedness and then some sort of uprootedness. Uh, this one um, has a little vessel form that's being held aloft and, and appears to have been pulled out of the ground. So uh, other things pulled out of the ground like signposts. I'm really interested in markers things that people put uh, so that they know uh, in a landscape where they are. And then the dislocation, pulling a signpost out of the ground so it literally means either nothing or it means something new. And um, so in this one, uh, this kind of meager space is provided for a Giacometti-like uh, figure, elongated figure inside of that angle iron. And again, using steel along with clay and all the creative possibilities of that. So um, uh, the possibility of uh, weightlessness, um, something pulled out of the ground and then uh, becoming a loft. And uh, when I break I, with tradition, I really go all the way. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, using house paint <clears throat> instead of glaze might be considered heresy inside of the ceramic tradition. And uh, I did it because... Uh, I needed a certain visual effect. And so here it is in this piece. Um, the idea of homelessness, the idea again of dislocation, the yearning for a home or a habitation of some kind. And uh, so in this piece, this uh, ceramic bottom part is a cross section of earth and then um, um, just a terribly tragic uh, thing. A lot in large cities like New York, where I come from, um, people that are homeless need to set up on hot air grates. And so in this piece, those grates breathe into the shroud-like material. Actually, that's bronze. Um, but it breathes the idea of a home into those shrouds. And um, so uh, a piece that comments on homelessness and another way of being dislocated. <clears throat> um, human habitation in general, I'm really fascinated with geology, geologic maps, 
uh, oftentimes uh, an area uh, that's infiltrated perhaps with another uh, uh, composition or maybe water is indicated in a map with an ellipse and in this case the ellipse is defined by these little white uh, doll's heads. I got a doll's head mold and slip cast about 350 of these little tiny heads so that the entire piece is um, literally clamping habitation together uh, with uh, a cross section of earth, uh, obviously adopting and using wood clamps to do that. Um, these are fairly large pieces, um, you know, eight, nine feet uh, tall or wide. Uh, and this piece this is called core sample. <clears throat> and um, they take a sample out of the ground to study the uh, composition of the earth. And so they drill this cylinder down into the ground and then extract it. So in this case, there's a segment of earth at the bottom. And then there's this device that might uh, be lowered into the earth and could extract a cylinder. In this case, it's of little angels praying that define that cylinder that's uh, been extracted. Uh, obviously, also certain Christian iconography worked into this uh, mechanized situation. And uh, also really interesting to me um, and kind of Asian, I think, in feel are a series of pieces that I uh, did that are kind of stage-like, and they combine, again, ceramics with another material, in this case, wood. So charred wood uh, supports a bunch of ceramic elements that are arranged strategically, kind of like a Zen garden, uh, oftentimes with something positive and something negative, both, both indicated in the same space. I was really influenced by a show that I saw in Chicago named A Primal Spirit and actually found a kinship with some of the artists who are first generation Japanese um, uh, sculptors from traditional craft families. And so with my teaching and my breaking away, I kind of felt like I'd found some brothers and sisters, uh, such like minded uh, sculptors. And it blew my mind in, in a sense um, that it presented not always a finished piece, but a piece in progress. So a piece in a normal sense, an exhibiting piece is not done, but the whole piece is about becoming. And uh, in this piece, um, uh, cakes of sulfur are sitting on copper, uh, big heavy copper sheets. And you see in the background, the scalded uh, surface that resulted from a previous interaction. So the sulfur actually interacts with the copper and produces this uh, scalded effect. And so what you're literally seeing is, a, is something in motion, in progress. And uh, the potential for that really interests me greatly. The hidden voice of materials that's evoked by some of these pieces. Um, Process, um, an artist named Nina Hull, who's also a ceramic artist, uh, not surprising that she would deal with um, uh, fire and, uh, and, and oftentimes uh, location of fire, uh, kiln-like structures that are incredibly visual and also are in process. So all of that interests me along with uh, my kiln building efforts. At the University of Montevallo, we've built a number of kilns. The most noteworthy of those probably is the 40-foot Japanese wood kiln called an Anagama, uh, called by us Fat Bastard, but lovingly, as that kiln is uh, 40 feet long and climbs up the side of a hill on campus. Uh, building it and enclosing space, I built the roof over it, which I'm almost more proud of than the kiln itself. Um, but for an object maker to, you know, construct things that enclose space the way this does and function the way the kiln does uh, was quite influential in uh, further sculpture. Uh, the dynamic of a wood kiln, uh, the process of feeding it fuel, trying to read the flame as you do when you're firing, 
Um, the idea that it's a central location for learning, that it's literally a classroom on fire, and that my students play central roles in firing it um, is really extraordinary and has brought people from uh, to date five different countries as well as a good deal of artists from the United States that come and fire with us and interact with our students. It's an incredibly dynamic um, experience. Uh, often one that's experimental and um, artists come here and uh, try things that have never been done. <clears throat> so my students participate in those activities. Here we're doing a high fire, wood fire version of a low fire technique called Raku. So we're pulling pieces out of the glowing hot kiln. Uh, this piece is about 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, which explains my gear. And then some of the installation work that I've done that is obviously influenced by firing and by building these kilns. And um, in anticipation of fire was an installation that I did in Birmingham. Uh, chaotic uh, wood planks, fuel, I suppose, uh, could also be uh, viewed as a, as a sort of a hiding place for a negative space that's perfectly shaped uh, as a vessel would be, and then the positive occurring across the uh, the space of the uh, gallery. <clears throat> so racks and racks of fuel, um, kilns that almost become altar-like. And building the Anagama yielded a piece called Core that I actually built while I was building the Anagama very active period of time. And so the dynamic of heat is visible in this piece, as well as the shape of the kiln. I started building crucibles. I started uh, being influenced by that vessel. Um, obviously, the industrial interpretation, um, you know, uh, vessels that melt Molten material for industry was one of my influences. And uh, then you can see it play out in my work, complete with fuel, charred wood, those sorts of things in these pieces. And uh, air intake, fuel, high heat, scalded surfaces, those sorts of things motivate my work. In some cases, these pieces are very, very large, at least for ceramic art, and um, are composed of a number of elements that I fire separately and then uh, assemble. Um, how do they tip? How do they function? What did they used to be? Uh, are we looking at just a remnant of, that uh, could be almost archeological in its sense? Uh, most recently, I had the honor of um, having a solo show in uh, Taipei, in Taiwan, at a place called the Inga Museum of Ceramic Art, which is an incredible uh, place, a cathedral for ceramic work. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, this is called the Sunlight Gallery. It's a very coveted place in the museum where the light of the gallery is supplied naturally. and. Uh, seems to animate different pieces as you look through the show. So one piece will be illuminated and then go dark in favor of another one. It's an incredible space. And not the least of which is my question to everybody, what's next? Um, I'm not done. Uh, this is a new kiln that I built right here at the university. It's a car kiln. So uh, you can see the scale of it. So if you have an idea that's over seven foot two inches, you're in trouble. But um, up to that, we can fire it. Uh, the floor retracts, could be brought into the studio so that we can build things on top and then plug it into the kiln housing. So when I say what's next, I say it with a lot of excitement because uh, there's always something cool coming up.